Welcome to Time Monk Radio Network. I'm Gemini, and we have Susan Wee joining us to continue our discussion of healthy breasts. Welcome back, Susan. Thank you, Gemini. I'm so glad to be back here with you. You know, last week we were talking about keeping our breasts healthy. And every October in the United States and Canada, um, we are subjected to Breast Cancer Prevention Month. Right? Yes. And for many, many years, I have been saying, could we please have Breast Health Awareness Month? Is there a difference? There certainly is. And one of the differences is that Breast Cancer Awareness Month is sponsored by the makers of Mammography Film. And they want you to believe that your only hope is to have a mammogram. When I was working on breast cancer, question mark, breast health, exclamation point, the wise woman way. Dr. Susan Love got in touch with me and asked me to include in my book recent research that had found that upon autopsy, healthy women who had died accidental deaths were found to have ductal carcinoma in their breasts about 40% of the time. Does this mean that there's an epidemic of breast cancer that we don't know about? No. What we know now is that ductal carcinoma in C2 is common in women and that usually, like prostate cancer, go back to what we talked about uh, last month, that prostate cancer can be very slow growing. It can be in a quiescent state where nothing really is happening. And this is true of ductal carcinoma in C2. So long as it is not um, smashed, so long as it is not irradiated, so long as it is not cut, it's not going to do anything. The head of the mammography program for all of the United Kingdom quit. And his statement when he quit is we are creating an epidemic of breast cancer by using mammograms. Mammograms are picking up ductal carcinoma in C2, which is not really cancer, and in the vast majority of cases would not go on to be cancer. But there is one way for sure to turn it into cancer, and that is to cut into that breast in any way at all and to stir, to disturb those cells. So this is kind of scary information. What's going on here? What's going on is a huge divide, a divide between people who say mammograms do not provide early detection, and mammograms give women a false sense of security. They do not lead to a reduction in death from breast cancer that we are being told. And another side that's saying your average American woman is not going to take care of herself. She's not going to eat lentils. She's not going to drink red clover. She's not going to massage her breasts with herbal oils. She's not going to be in touch with her body. As a matter of fact, she is going to be totally dependent on the doctor's two-minute examination once a year and a mammogram to find out if she has breast cancer. And the rest of the time, she is going to act like her breasts don't exist. I guess I have a different opinion of women. I guess I think that women are given information about how they can keep their breasts healthy, that they will want to do it. And they will say, gosh, I don't have to do a whole long big breast exam. I mean, wow, if I spend even 10 seconds a day touching my breast, that's a minute a week. There's 52 weeks in a year. That means I'll have touched my breast 52 minutes in one year. Would that be better than a doctor touching my breast for two minutes? You bet it would. When my book, Brust Krebs, Brust Gesundheit, Der Weisen Frauen Weg, was published in Germany, that's breast cancer, question mark, breast health, exclamation point, the wise woman way, I was booked to teach at a brand new series of um, breast cancer treatment st- centers that had uh, just been opened up throughout Germany. And um, 
at the first one, I looked at it. You know, fortunately, there were women from uh, town there as well as the interns from uh, uh, this place and the doctors there. And, um, I, you know, they struck a little fear in my heart, I must admit. But I looked at them and, you know, put on my most winning smile and said, I'm not here to argue with you. I'm not here to say anything other than bravo for the great work that you do. And, you know, I'm, and I am not against your methods at all. I have friends who are alive because they did chemotherapy and friends there that are alive because they did radiation therapy and friends who are alive because they did uh, surgery. And you're not going to find me doctor bashing or putting down what you do. But I know and you know that from the time that a breast cancer cell starts growing in the breast, if it has an average doubling day length of 100 days, that until it's big enough to be seen on a mammogram, which is at least a million cells, it's going to take seven years. And that there are women sensitive enough to feel proprioceptively something happening in their bodies before that tiny speck of a million cells that we can see on a mammogram. And that woman is going to come to you and say, there's something going on with my breast. And all you can say to her right now is, I can't find anything. Don't worry. And pat her on the head and send her home. And I've got some things that you can offer her, like red clover infusion and eating lentils, like seaweed and mushrooms, that she can go home and she can do and she can feel that she has power and participatory effect on her own life and her own health. And perhaps if she does have early stage cancer, maybe she can turn that away. Well, the main MD got up and he glowered at me and he said to me, if she has cancer, I find it. If I don't find it, she doesn't have cancer. He stalked out. Because not everyone wants us to have power. We can't expect that all healthcare practitioners are happy to have us say, no, I'm not going to do a mammogram. My breast health is in my own hands. I love the woman who said to me, I get up every day. And I walk to the bathroom mirror, I put my breasts in my hands, and I say, you're in good hands with me, girls. (laughs) You know, this joyous being, who we are, not this fear-ridden, they had cancer, oh! You know, wow, how did medicine ever bring us to such a state? So mammograms, I want to know, I said, how much radiation is there in a mammogram? Have you ever asked that question? No, I have not. And I I don't follow the typical protocol that they hound you to follow. So, <laughs> no. Well, one person said it's about the same as living in Denver. And actually, one week at a high altitude like Denver is about one millirad of radiation. Or somebody said, it's like taking a jet flight across the country. And a jet flight of six hours is five millirads of radiation. For comparison's sake, a chest x-ray is about 16 millirads. Most chest chest x-rays are taken from the back, and about one millirad of that actually reaches the breast tissue. Are you sitting down? I am. The smallest possible dose from a screening mammogram done with the best, newest equipment just calibrated just before your mammogram is 340 millirads. Wow. That's not a jet trip, is it? Mm. That's not living in Denver, is it? As a matter of fact, a mammogram is the highest level of radiation used in any single x-ray done on the human body. And most of the time, it's not one mammogram, is it? It's at least two per breast. And people who do it and people who've had it done say, and at least half the time we have to do more than two per breast because we don't quite get it right. 
I've been shown the instructions that the technicians are given, and it says, tighten the plates on the breast until the woman complains of discomfort. I have a chapter in my book, Breast Cancer, question mark, breast health, exclamation point, the wise woman way, talking about massaging your own breasts and using infused herbal oils to massage your breasts. And for no other reason than to be in touch with your breasts. To have a reason to be touching your breasts. They, oh, yes, well, I have this wonderful infused oil, and I'm going to rub it on my breasts. Yes, but a perfect way. Because we don't want to go fearfully, oh, I must touch my breasts as their cancer. Don't know. We want to go joyfully uh, into this. Well, I sent this chapter out to several MDs, and they all returned it to me with a sticky note or a red pen marking or, a, you know, an attached letter that said, very dangerous technique. A woman could touch her breasts with so much pressure that she could burst a small cancer. Really? <laughs> Yet yeah, having it squeezed in the plates of a machine is okay. Sometimes one thinks that the right hand of science knows not what the left hand is doing. Mm-hmm. So there's a government task force called the Preventative Health Services Task Force. And it is funded by our tax dollars. And the Preventative Services Health Task Force has a mandate, and that mandate is to look with an unprejudiced eye at the information available about so-called preventative health services and to determine whether or not they are safe, effective, and reasonable. Three years ago, the task force said mammograms should not be used for routine screening. They are not safe. They are not effective. They are not reasonable. Do you remember this, Gemini? I do. And what happened? Did women say, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you've been pulling my leg all this time and having me do something that isn't safe, effective, and reasonable? Is that what women said? No, I don't recall that. I've never been so upset in my entire life. I never so much wanted to hang it up and say, woman, I am not you. No, my sister said, you can't take our mammograms away from us. Like, like reverse psychology. <laughs> you know, and the same Preventative Services Health Task Force has come out last year saying PSA test, uh-uh. Now, I have not seen or heard, and maybe it's just because of I'm out of the flow here, but I have not seen a whole bunch of men standing up and saying you can't take our PSA test away from us. So it's interesting to me that women have become so wedded to this idea that mammograms keep them safe and that mammograms are preventative medicine. They are not preventative medicine. As a matter of fact, if you had a mammogram every year between the ages of 40 and 60, within that 20-year span, your breasts will have received more hard radiation than a woman epicenter in Hiroshima when we dropped the atomic bomb. Wow. That's startling to think that. And I don't know what the recommendation is uh, for the mammograms, what what the typical protocol is, like if they do it at 40, 45, and how often. I, I don't even know. And you know what? It's very hard to know because it's a shifting sand. Okay. And because it, it remains an enormous controversy. And we talked some, some about that last week, that th- there is so much difference of opinion about whether or not mammograms are – outright harmful and killing women or helpful and saving lives and you will find vociferous opinions on both sides. My opinion based up on scientific facts that I have been able to come up with is that I would rather take care of my own breasts than expose them to hard radiation. Do you mind, and unless you were going to cover this a little later, what kind of infused oils do you use on your breast? Like something infused in olive oil? Yes. 
Um, and I, I it absolutely infuse in olive oil, but it doesn't have to be olive oil. It can be like almond oil or any, they're called carrier oils, any oil that you particularly like. So jojoba would work or a vitamin E oil or? Jojoba is wonderful. Okay. And as I said, there's a whole uh, chapter on taking our breast health into our own hands. And I go through all, uh, I call them a slippery assortment of herbal oils, burdock seed oil calendula blossom oil. It's a renowned old wives remedy against breast cancer and yet gentle enough for regular use. I a love calendula oil. oil. Oh, yeah, we love calendula oil, don't we? Oh, it's, and it's so really silky. Helps. It is, and it really helps prevent scarring too. So if you do decide on a mammogram or surgery, calendula oil is a wonderful ally to help prevent scarring and to help prevent adhesions from any surgery. Okay. And uh, castor oil. And, of course, Edgar Casey was a big castor yeah. oil man, huh? He sure yeah. was. He was, you know, castor oil, everything. And so I, you know, include a recipe for making his castor oil pack. I had a woman um, who um, asked for my assistance once. She had a breast cancer, and it was growing in the top part of her breast, which is often the place where breast cancer starts. It's kind of in that area at the top of the breast, under the armpit, and by the, um, under the, the uh, clavicle there. And um, it was a non-metastasizing tumor, but it had grown, and it was bigger than her breast, and it was pretty ugly. And she was really surgery shy, and uh, she wanted to kind of burn it off herself, and she was doing poke root poultices. And they were making a real mess um, of her chest. And um, so uh, we started doing castor oil packs in between. And then we did a rotation with poke root, comfrey root, and castor oil. And that seemed to be a pace at which her body could accept that the poke was really burning her. However, poke oil is used by women who are dealing with breast cancer. And is, can be used, some of these things can be used as alternatives to surgery. But let me tell you, they're really, really difficult to use. You know, dandelion flower makes a great oil. And if you go back to my green book, Healing wise, Dr. Dinti Leon says, You know, I love the ladies' breasts. I'm so good for the ladies' breasts. And take me, are you having no problems with my breasts? And Dr. Dandelion, he will come and help. <laughs> you know, so that dandelion flower oil, superb ally for regular massage and um, people who are doing a therapeutic breast massage. And that is one of the most blessed things that has grown out of my, out of my book. Is that I really put out the call for more massage therapists to do breast massage, to not act like, you know, they act like there isn't the front of your body, oh, your legs, your arms, your back, your neck, your face. That's it. It's right. like, come on, the breasts are important too. And so there are more people actually doing breast massage. Now, non-erotic, helpful breast massage, just like the rest of the massage. We do want to beware and not use essential oils. I think we've talked about this before. Yes. And uh, we also talked about it, them in relationship to gut flora. And we were just talking about the importance of being able to ferment things um, and to get those things from your foods um, in our last segment. And the essential oils cut down on gut flora. So uh, we don't want to use essential oils in our breast massage. We just want to use the infused oils. One woman who is um, doing quite a bit of breast massage, and that includes women um, post-surgery who've had cancer, uh, women who are just in the early stages of diagnosis, and women who want to prevent. She loves the evergreen oils. She uses cedar. She uses white pine. She uh, uses uh, thuya. Um, she uses spruce. She says she just loves uh, the infused oils from these evergreen trees, and she feels, you know how the needles can be kind of sharp and pointy? Yes. It feels like the oil carries that sharp pointy into the breast and kind of does that to breast cancer cells. Oh, It's a really big image, huh? Very interesting. So what, you would just take, like, the needles and infuse them in the oil like you would calendula or dandelion? Yeah. Wow, Okay. I, I hadn't heard of that. That sounds great. Yeah, yes. And all of these are very easy to do. Plantain leaf, of course, is one of my favorite mm -hmm. oils, and it can be used for anything, anything at all. But 
Um, there are several validated reports of women who use plantain oil to reverse in situ ductal carcinoma in situ. In other words, this ductal carcinoma was diagnosed and they then refused further surgery. They did the biopsy and stopped there and used plantain oil and were able to successfully reverse it. And it was no longer, they could no longer see it. So, wow. Hooray for our ordinary plantain leaf oil, red clover blossom oil. We were talking before about red clover blossom and how the infusion can keep our breast healthy. Well, the infused oil melts away all kinds of lumps and helps the lymphatic system reabsorb and get rid of cancer cells. So if you had to choose one of those oils, do you have a preference? Well, there's three more, St. Jones Word Oil, Yarrow Oil, and Yellow Duck Oil. Okay. And Yarrow Oil has an interesting side effect. It cuts down on the growth of new blood vessels. So if there's a diagnosis of cancer, the, what we want to do is we want to prevent metastasis. We want to prevent the growth of blood vessels to the cancer. And this is what the newest drugs do. So by using yarrow oil on that area, even if it's just a scarred area where the surgery has been, we can help block that angiogenesis, the growth of new blood vessels. The yellow dark oil is a classic oil that has been used for hundreds and hundreds of years against all heart swellings, tumors, growths, eruptions, cancers. You know, cancer wasn't a word that was usually used in the older herbal, so you kind of had to search. And um, yellow dock has always been, I've always thought of it as kind of a, a secret herb in a way because it's really common. It's like underfoot everywhere, and yet people don't use it very much. But when I was looking into Essiac, you've heard of Essiac, right? I have. Yeah, a lot of people, when I get a diagnosis of cancer and say, I want to do something herbally, they rush right out and get Essiac. And the I, of tea, course, right? throw my, my, the back of my hand to my forehead and go, go, Calhoun, do not get Essiac. Whatever you do, don't get Essiac. And it's a pretty interesting story. Uh, Nurse Casey, whose name is Essiac, spelled backwards, or actually Essiac right. is her name, spelled backwards, um, was doing a physical on a woman who had a scar on her breast. And Nurse Casey said, what is this? And the woman said, oh, it's a um, scar from my breast cancer. Well, this was back when if you had breast cancer, you were dead. So Nurse Casey went, ha, 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 you know, I don't believe you. The woman said, well, yeah, you know, a Native American showed me these two herbs, and I drank them, and I got rid of my cancer. And not too long after that, of course, somebody in Nurse Casey's family was diagnosed with breast cancer, and there were no treatments at that point. And so Nurse Casey said, whoa, I'm going to get these two roots and use them. Now, of course, controversy reigns over what two roots they were. Isiac, as it currently stands, is turkey rhubarb root, which is a cathartic and has never been used as an anti-cancer herb. Uh, sheep sorrel, um, which is a um, plant that has a lot of acid in it but has never been used internally as anti-cancer, only externally, and that's because it literally burns cancers off. Slippery elm. Um, which I believe is put in there to counter the effects of the turkey rhubarb root because it's such a cathartic. And burdock. And I actually think that burdock was one of the two herbs in the original formula, and I think the other one was yellow dock. Because yellow dock has such an all-around powerful reputation for being an anti-cancer herb. So, again... This maybe is a woman who doesn't have a diagnosis, but she's got a lump in her breast, and she's worried about it, and she doesn't know what it is, and she might choose to use yellow dock oil, and this is made from the root. And then St. Jones Word Oil, red oil. Oh, we all love our red oil, and I'll be talking a lot more about red oil when we talk about integrative medicines. It is one of the best of the integrative medicines for women who are fighting fire with fire. So if I just had to choose one of them, I would probably choose dandelion. And I would choose dandelion because Dr. Dandelion loves breasts and because dandelion is a very generous plant. It blooms heavily fairly early on, but then I noticed it just keeps blooming here and there and here and there. 
And so we can almost always send some dandelion to give us a hand. And you just use the blooms on that and not the leaves? You could make an oil from any part of the dandelion, but the dandelion blossoms are definitely okay. the best use. I think the calendula and dandelion sound like a lovely combination. Oh, those golden girls, huh? Yes. <laughs> I know I have never been able to successfully grow calendula, and I have tried so many times, and people look at me and go, but it's so easy to grow, and I go, well, maybe it just doesn't like growing in rocks, because I have two kinds of soil where I live, broken rock and solid rock. Okay. And so maybe the calendula just is not happy. It was admittedly 15 years of living here before I was able to build up enough soil for the first dandelion to grow here. Oh, wow. It's an old rock quarry. It's a it's a tough piece of real estate in terms of gardening. Sure. But you know what? There's lots of weeds that are very happy. And there's always lawns with dandelion on it. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So the new thing, um, and it's really not even that new. Thermograms have been around for decades. And a thermogram is just what it sounds like. It is a heat signature of the breath. So the equipment is able to gauge the temperature of the breast. Remember mood rings? Yes. Right, and you'd put on a mood ring, right? And <laughs> if you were hot, it would be one color. And if you were cold, it would be another color. Right. right. So a cancer is rapidly reproducing cells. And that means they're hot. Where the, Because there's energy going on. There's, you know, the DNA is moving out. Things are happening there. So there's heat. So when we do a thermogram, if we see areas of heat, then we could say, uh-oh, there could be cancer there. I think the really important thing to remember is that at this point, the only way we have of definitely diagnosing cancer is by cutting into the body, taking a piece, cutting that piece into very, very thin slices and looking at it under a microscope. That's called a biopsy. And with every kind of cancer, the only way to actually say you have cancer is to take a, do a biopsy. Unfortunately, if the biopsy comes back negative, we can't actually say you don't have cancer because we just took a piece. And maybe we missed the piece where the cancer was. I just had a friend, and she went in for gallbladder surgery. And she had had some liver problems earlier in her life that had left some scar tissue in her liver. And the attending physician said, I would like to do a liver biopsy while we're doing the gallbladder operation. And I was kind of, you know, they want to take a slice out of your liver. And she said, I don't know, I just have a feeling we need to do it. Well, the slice that they took contained a cancer. And the slice was big enough to get the whole cancer and the edge where the cut was, was 0. 0.03 centimeters from the cancer. So you think how easy it would have been for them not to get it. And yet her intuition and the surgeon's intuition were right there honing in and they found it and it's gone. So as I said in our last session together, we will be talking about surgery and chemotherapy and radiation because these are not things that we want to avoid at all costs. At all costs means death. All right. As I said, I have friends living because of these things. So is a thermogram better than a mammogram? Wow. I wish I could just say, sure it is. But you know, again, it's hard to say. I've had women call me up in real despair and panic. One of them went to have a thermogram, and she said to the person doing the thermogram, look, I have a little bit of mastitis, I'm still lactating, and you're going to find that hot area in my breast. And nonetheless, the lab that did the thermogram called her up and said, you have breast cancer, you better get down here right away so we can start treatment. Oh. And you know, even if you know you don't, when you hear those words, <gasps> Oh, well, sure, it your takes your breath stop. away. Yeah. You know, it does, you know, and it takes a lot to, like, regain your center and say, I do not have cancer. And to deal with, you know, and modern scientific medicine can be very aggressive about pushing people into treatment. 
because they are used to people not liking the treatments. So if we don't want them, we do really have to stand up. So thermograms are not without their problems and probably even more difficult. Many women have gotten in touch with me and said, I told my doctor I wanted a thermogram. And they said, sure, you can have a thermogram, but it's a thermogram and a mammogram. You can't have one without the other. Well, of course, most women are interested in the thermogram, so they don't have to have a mammogram. In certain cities that I've been in, the women have to bust themselves to a thermogram clinic. But again, let's come back to you're in good hands with me, girl. You know, it's not that you suddenly wake up one day with a big lump in your breast. And if you do, the mammogram won't help you because there are cancers that double much faster than every every 100 days. There are cancers that between one mammogram and another can get big enough to kill you. So you can have an all-clear mammogram and an appointment the next year and die in between. Mm. So being in touch on a daily basis, to me, is far better than a mammogram or a thermogram. Because when I do either a mammogram or a thermogram, and I'm not against them diagnostically, we're talking about screening. We're talking about based on fear. Do I have cancer? I need to. I need to look in there and see. All right? Did we ever, as children, hear the story of Pandora's box and what happened when she opened the box? Uh huh. Yes. I feel like the mammograms are Pandora's box. We have that box closed. I'm not saying stick your head in the stand and be an idiot. I'm saying be more proactive than a mammogram would be. And if you find something, if you feel something, then hooray that we have high-tech diagnosis. Usually when I write a book, I write the book for one person. Seems odd, doesn't it? I'm writing reference books I should try to write for everybody, but no. It's far better if I write for one person person and yet I had to have, have that person have, have a dual personality when I wrote breast cancer question mark breast health exclamation point I had to write for the woman who knows there's nothing wrong like the woman who, who knew that she had a breast infection she didn't have cancer and who has to fight off the people who were telling her who have cancer and I wrote for the woman who knows there is something wrong and they're patting her head and telling her to go home and not worry. So what can we say? We need to be in touch with ourselves. Mammograms put us out of touch with ourselves. Let's use them for what they're designed for to give us more information, but not to feed our fear or to try to ally the fear that the scientific tradition brings up in us. Sometimes, there is a shadow on the mammogram. Sometimes we do have a lump. We're going to come back next week, and we're going to talk about what we can do if we think that we might have cancer. As a matter of fact, I gave the manuscript of my book to a dear friend of mine, and she spent about a month reading it, and she gave it back to me, and she said, my gosh, Susan, she said, there is so much information in this book. You start off with all the foods that we can eat to help prevent cancer. That's just fabulous. I love that part of it. And then you talk about the things that, that we can do to prevent breast cancer, and you talk about um, the, the, all the, the self-massage and the oils, and you, then you just go right through, you know, cancer and the treatment. She said, it's too much. I said, what do you mean? She says, it's too much. I said, I want, well, she says, I want one page. I said, you want what? She said, I want it all on one page. So when we come back together again next week, I'm going to tell you what page that is. It's called the Breast Lump Option Circuit, where I did my best to put it all on one page for you. I so enjoyed being with you. Green blessings, Gemini. Uh, thank you, Susan. And, you know, just to wrap this segment up, I, you know, something you said has struck me, and I, I think sometimes we need a reminder of this, that it, it's really important as women um, to really stay in touch with our intuition and find our center and not become complacent and lax and hope that the medical profession will, will find stuff that's going on in our bodies when we should be in tune with it every day. And I think that's really important. Yes, not in tune based on fear, not being anxious, 
you know, I had a student who called me up every week and she said, I'm going to get breast cancer. I'm going to get breast cancer. Oh my. And I, I did my best to say to her, whoa, you know, let's, you know, let's stop with this and let's say, what can we do not to get breast cancer? And she said, no, I'm going to get breast cancer. You know, and two years later she called up and she said, see, I got breast cancer. Like she manifested that maybe. Well, it's hard to know now, isn't it? It is. Did she really know that she had breast cancer? Or did she manifest it? Wow, nobody can say. Right. There's just no way to tell. So we always make the best decisions we can with the best information we have at the time. And let's love ourselves. Absolutely. Even if we make a decision that we later decide, wow, I have some new information and I wouldn't have made that decision today. Okay. Right. Made it in the past. We always make the best decisions we can. I agree. Well, thank you so much, Susan. And I'm sure I'm going to have a few questions for you in the next segment. And um, this is very informative and so appreciate you being here with us at Time Monk Radio. Thank you so much. Join us next week where Susan will return with a discussion of promoting healthy breasts. On behalf of Time Monk Radio, be well. <laughs>